So Echo came up uh, in my conversations with the curator, Lena Essling, uh, kind of motivated um, from this place of delight for me because on one hand, my work is very often engaging um, processes of um, recursion or, or iteration. Something comes back. Um, something that had been said at one moment in time returns in a present moment in time. So this idea of, of something from the past bouncing into the future um, has always been a methodology that I've used. And on top of that, I've been uh, always fascinated by the mythological figure of Echo. Uh, and in particular, these feminist writers um, who I uh, appreciate and, and the way that they've talked about uh, the feminist possibilities in this mythological figure who in some ways was punished for her gift with language. Um, and what I think is interesting is that Echo's curse um, was that she was no longer able to speak her own words but had to repeat the words of others. And for me, the, the sort of relation or intersection I find in my, own in my own work or with my own work is that that idea of repeating something that has already been said can actually be uh, an act. It can be an action. It can have the force of language or the force of original speech. This piece that uh, is over here to my left is called Join Us. And in some ways, I don't even uh, necessarily consider it um, an artwork proper um, in that it's not my authorship. It's the authorship of um, hundreds of um, activists from yeah, 1940 to 2012 when I collected all of these. And then also I went about this organizing project of trying to gather all of these flyers with um, the help of somebody I was working with at the time named Angela Beeler, a, a younger artist. And what we essentially did is reached out to friends, we reached into our own archives, we then went to certain formal archives to just um, gather up flyers that uh, in essence function with this kind of call, the call of uh, join us. So that's the kind of organizing rubric of all of these, but then of course they move through a whole set of urgencies. Um, some around the AIDS crisis, as you said, in the 80s. Um, some around um, uh, resistance and protest against police brutality. Some around um, what in the early uh, sort of 2011 was uh, known as the Occupy Movement, um, a kind of older set that deals with Vietnam War. And that provides, hopefully, an opening where someone from uh, the various publics that will encounter the exhibition can find their way to something that they may remember. They may remember a certain set of things that happened uh, historically, and that that feels like a kind of setting the stage for a kind of connectedness and a kind of belonging, a kind of access. There was a historic exhibition that happened in the early 70s, um, and it was called the Pier 18 Projects. And they kind of have a, um, they're, they're beautiful projects, and it was about doing actions for a camera. It happened to be that all of those artists were men. Um, and I was invited in 2014, I guess, by Cecilia Alamane, who's a curator with the Highline Art. Um, also on the west side of Manhattan. And Cecilia wanted to redo or, or do a kind of responsive project uh, 40 years later called Pier 54, where she selected only women artists. Um, one of the things that was interesting to me about that is that this particular slogan that I engaged, this is a piece called Women of the World Unite, they said, and the banner Women of the World Unite, a very long, large, per perhaps 40, 50 foot long banner, um, was used in a number of different actions uh, in 1970, organized around the women's strike for peace. What was interesting to me is that this thing that we often read as an accident of history, in a way, that, that all 27 artists in the Pier 18 project were men, because that's how it was back then, uh, isn't really true. Um, there were plenty of um, people speaking at the time about the need for a kind of re-examination of what we might say are the um, is the relationship between gender and inclusion or you know opportunity. So 
I was interested in the possibility of ev evoking or re-invoking a debate that was happening then. But when we get further in history, we sort of erase the fact that there was already a demand, um, being that we reconsider how gender plays in structural uh, formations like exhibition making, uh, artist support, artist access, and um, um, opportunity. This piece was made in 2007, and in the U.S., um, that particular moment in time was a fairly bleak moment for a lot of us who were working in activist circles and um, in particular activism uh, in resistance or protestation against the uh, U.S. invasion of Iraq and the ongoing war in Iraq. Um, it was kind of this moment where it felt like um, the idea of taking to the streets wasn't getting us anywhere. It wasn't stopping the war. It wasn't making political change. Um, and I became interested in, uh, in essence, I'm interested in talking about the war, but I think there was such a kind of despondency and a way of turning away that uh, I, I chose to kind of talk indirectly about the war, to talk through the language of love. I thought talking to you like this would make me miss you less, but it's having the opposite effect. I'm standing on the street and people are passing in front of me and behind me, and I look at them and I find traces of you. So what I'm doing in this piece is I'm standing on the street um, in midtown Manhattan addressing an unnamed lover. I emerged from a building at 51st and 6th Avenue every day for a work week, Monday through Friday, and I kind of speak this continuing um, call to this lover who I can't find. But it's also a, um, a call and a text that tries to address what, how are our intimate lives bound up with our public lives, with our political lives, what kinds of um, sort of joys and pleasures can we have as uh, lovers, um, as friends, as collaborators in a moment when um, on a civic level we're actually waging a war sort of you know, across the ocean and thousands of miles away. So, um, so I think the work is trying to ask at its base, what's the relationship between um, who we are personally and who we are politically, and how are those things bound up together? What are our desires, um, both for a better world and a better um, set of life chances for all of us, and our desire for our own uh, life chances and pleasure and ability to thrive? This is really one of the anchors of the exhibition, this project. It's, it's uh, where my discussions with the curator, Lena Essling, began, um, and precipitated by this really wonderful um, acquisition. It is a work that uh, I completed in 2016, and that in which I'm dealing with newsletters um, from uh, the US and the UK, 1955 to 1977, that were um, published out of communities and collectives, activist collectives, publishing collectives. What I was interested in about these collectives and these um, materials is that it's, it's a pre-Stonewall moment, so a pre-sort of gay liberation moment. And as a young person, uh, in, as a 20-something year old in the early 90s in New York, I had always thought of this as a kind of um, assimilationist moment, a moment where, where LGBT Q activists weren't quite ready to be radical. And as I was lingering and moving in these archives and discovering these newsletters and small run magazines, my, of course my total ignorance and naivete was blown to shreds because what you encounter in these pages is very much of the voices that we uh, feel and, and experience in our own community today. Um, voices that uh, are also doing this very, very important and radical work of taking the narrative of uh, LGBTQ lives out of the regime of psychiatry and therefore out of this rubric of pathology and starting to self-narrate. Like it, these political, the political project of these groups was very much about tell us what you're doing, tell us your story, tell us what you care about, tell us what your hobbies are, tell us who you are. And so this piece revolves around letters from the editor to readers and letters from readers to the editor, which also ends up being reader to reader.
Um, and for me, this is this really extraordinary um, instance of people forming political identity and political community through writing and reading. And that it's happening in the space of this kind of uh, condition that I've started calling a protected publicity. It was very important that the readers be protected, that their identities be protected, and there was great care taken to protect those identities so people wouldn't lose their jobs, their family relations, their um, roommates um, who didn't know that they were uh, queer. But it was also important that it be public, that they have each other to talk to, because it was strangers talking to each other. And very often in their voices you hear um, the sentiment of, I didn't know there was anyone else out there like me. Uh, and and what is also um, important for me is that the this public hoarding board, uh, which I think is what this is known as in Europe, um, on this first encounter, what you see in, in a way is the back of the public board, um, but here are these reproductions that I've made of um, elements of the archive so that viewers and readers can kind of encounter some of the words that you hear around the other side filtered through a contemporary uh, reader. Shall we go around? Yes. Three. So on the other side of the board, what you see are essentially five video projections um, and also five rooms of one single house. Um, I'm very interested uh, in the relationship, again, between the personal and the political and also in um, sort of teasing and revealing the way that for um, LGBTQ folks, for feminists, very often the domestic site, the home, was also a site of political production. So a lot of these collectives, these publishing collectives, were, were publishing out of a home. And also that this, these forms of political community making were happening largely from people's homes. So the idea of sort of filming these contemporary readers, this, these are 13 readers um, that I met in Philadelphia in the US who identify as um, a range of identities, lesbian, dyke, genderqueer, gender nonconforming, trans women, trans men, trans folks. Um, and they um, don't, they don't try to uh, sort of overtake the voice of the original writer, but rather to kind of act as a medium where that voice can come back to us and out of the archive and kind of address us in this, in this space here. over you, surely. Dear sisters, I felt I had to make a contribution to you even though I don't know yet if I qualify to receive your newsletter, since I don't know yet whether I'm a lesbian or not. I've only recently come to realize that I might be and my position is complicated by the fact that I'm coming not from heterosexuality, but from what I thought for years was asexuality. In my little corner of the world, anyone would love you is the A and B side of a Anita Bryant 45. Anita Bryant was a singer on the 50s, 60s, 70s, um, really saccharine, kind of overly uh, syrupy songs. And she also became uh, a spokesperson for Tropicana Orange Juice. So she was selling Tropicana Orange Juice in advertisements uh, across the US in the 70s. And then also took a uh, passion project, I guess she might say, to be the spokesperson for a, a really um, rabid right-wing organization called Save Our Children in Florida. Um, and they were um, fiercely opposed to an ordinance that had recently passed through um, a, a city uh, in Florida that allowed for gay rights, that basically said gay people should not be discriminated against um, because of their sexuality. And Save Our Children, with Anita Bryan as their spokesperson, started a really uh, fierce, ultimately successful campaign to beat the ordinance, to kill it. So she became a kind of pariah to the uh, to, to gay activists, to the LGBT community in particular. And at a um, public press conference in 1977, an activist named Tom Higgins um, pied her in the face on uh, sort of in front of the media. And his statement afterwards to some journalists was, "I saved her a bullet." Um, 
the implication being that she's so vilified that something bad is going to happen. And this, this action, I think, to, in essence, to quiet her, to cease her speech, was what became most interesting to me. This kind of somewhat lighthearted, somewhat spectacular, somewhat sort of parodic or, you know, um, uh, absurd way to uh, quiet her uh, hatred and to quiet her virulence. This is a piece called Gay Power, um, and Gay Power is a collaboration between me, um, the late feminist, U.S. feminist um, writer and um, activist Kate Millett, and um, a collective that Kate Millett was a part of in the early 70s called the Women's Liberation Cinema. And the Women's Liberation Cinema was a group of um, sort of uh, up to about 10 people who were interested in making films. Um, from a kind of feminist point of view towards women's liberation. And they had uh, completed a big project and went out to shoot another one in the midst of the um, second annual Christopher Street Liberation Day Parade, which was in 1971. Uh, and so this is an early, what we now think of as a pride parade, but at that moment was known as a Christopher Street Liberation Day Parade. Um, an early moment of what Kate Millett calls this becoming tribe that has taken to the streets of New York in a, in a moment where it's not clear whether they will, will be welcomed or um, uh, shouted, shouted down in a sense. This piece came about because um, a programmer as part, who programs for the um, Experimental gay, um, gay and Lesbian Film Festival in New York um, found this raw footage in a locker of one of the members of the collective, Susan Kleckner. And he bumped into me on the street and said, will you put, oh, we have this great footage, but it's silent and nobody's going to watch it if it's silent, and would you put sound to it? And I, I, I think he might have been thinking I was someone else because I think his expectation was that I score it with music and make it kind of lively. And what I was most interested in was the possibility of um, uh, actually bringing it back to Kate Millett and to ask her to comment on it from the moment of the 2000s. Um, and so I met her and recorded her viewing the footage again for the first time in um, maybe 40, 40 years. By now, this is probably, you know, sort of monstrous and silly, but uh, at the time, it meant a great deal to do that. It was a very different parade than in those days. I mean, we were very afraid. Uh, we didn't know what would happen to us. And uh, <laughs> maybe our mothers would see us on the evening news. <laughs> it was very scary. Somehow, what I see in this footage of the 1971 Christopher Street Liberation Day march are people coinciding with themselves. How do we perceive the vulnerability when the signs and the bodies declare themselves with such ferocity and clarity? Second-class citizenship must go. Closets are for clothes. Out of the closets and into the streets. So her commentary and then my commentary is on top of the piece um, on headphones so that you both have a, an experience and some autonomy with the film as a document. The film as a document of this moment um, where, in my mind, gay, gay, LGBTQ, queer, love was used as a political um, as a political act, that uh, what I was really interested in around gay liberation was that um, there was this kind of uh, strutting and this kind of flamboyance that people in that moment were ready to take on, and that it is both a sharing and a joy and a pleasure with each other, and also um, a refusal to uh, shove that expression away. So to, to have that expression find a, pub, a publicity, to have it make a public appearance where it might absolutely have agitated uh, sort of conservative or right-wing um, pundits and others, but, that, it, um, but that, it, that the political movement had to move forward to this place of public appearance.
This is a work called 77, um, and it essentially has two forms. Um, it's a set of 10 wooden panels with basically half an English letter on each panel. So um, as you see it now, uh, I think one can recognize that it's a component of a letter. And what you're sort of offered to do as you walk into the room is try to figure out what does this say. Um, when it is all spelled out, it is the letters W-O-M-A-N, which is woman, uh, in the singular. And, and it's a recreation of a banner that existed on the stage of a political convention that happened in New York in, uh, sorry, in Houston in 1977, which was a national women's convention. And they were charged with assessing the status of women in the U.S. And they produced a 26 uh, point platform that they presented to then President Jimmy Carter, um, which largely went nowhere. It was a really feminist, very progressive platform that um, put in place all these things that to this day um, we don't have in place in the U.S. So I'm interested both in the term woman and its fracture um, and a, a kind of question, I think, that the piece can propose about um, in what way can we organize around gender? Uh, do we need new language in order to organize around gender? How do we, what, what is useful still about the term woman? Um, and how do we find a kind of, how do we find openings in, in this moment when also a very necessary challenge is happening to kind of binary structures? This is a room uh, of, full of two pieces that are part of a larger project I have called Ricerche. Eventually, Ricerche will have five components. The two um, that are finished, the first one I began is um, sort of deeper into the room and is not on right now. They alternate back and forth. And that's called Ricerche 3. And that's an extended interview with 35 students at an all-women's college in the U.S. called um, Mount Holyoke College. And then in front of us is uh, the newest work, um, or one of the newest works in the show, one of two brand new works in the show, and this is called Ricerche 1. Ricerche 1 is a conversation on either side of this triangle with... Um, kids of LGBTQ parents. Um, on the side that we can see right now, it's young adults. On the other side, it's five to eight-year-olds. And essentially, in these works, I'm stepping off of a really brilliant film by the um, auteur filmmaker Pier Paolo Pasolini, the Italian. In 1963, he made a um, work called Comisi de Amore, or in English it's translated as love meetings. And he essentially went all across Italy interviewing people about sex and sexuality, but also to, to engage them with uh, who do we want to be as a, as, a, as a citizenry? Who do we want to be as an Italian, as an Italian and as Italians? And what do we think about the repression of uh, sexual minorities? And what do we think about um, these kind of religious strictures on what we can be as uh, persons in relation to each other? With the Mount Holyoke um, interview, um, I'm using some questions that I draw directly from Pasolini that seem kind of out of date, like um, what do you think about virginity or does marriage solve sexual problems? Questions I would never ask young people at this moment. Um, but then also some questions of my own. And while all of these students are um, technically inside of a a, a same-sex college, their experience of gender and sexuality is um, incredibly diverse and differentiated along, along a really broad spectrum. And so they talk about both their relationship to gender, sexuality, but also their relationship to re religion and um, religious tolerance and their relationship to feminism and, and come in the end to a kind of a form of a disagreement, um, but I think a really important one for those of us who are trying to think through transnational feminisms, how we can connect across different cultural locations and different um, uh, uh, sort of pos positionalities. But then at some point, like complete tolerance becomes a tolerance for intolerance, and I think that that's an issue which all of us think about all the time. Yeah, and just because we grow up in the States doesn't mean that we don't have issues back home. 
Like I grew up on, a Nav on the Navajo reservation and there are issues where people are getting raped and there's substance abuse and domestic abuse. I grew up in an area that's highly impoverished. But as a community, it's important to talk about those things. What do you think? I know like for me personally, I was never in an environment where you know empowering women was like a very conscious point. So like coming here and even uh, it might not be so extreme in some cases, but just coming here, I feel like I have learned more about it. I've been able to appreciate it, so. Whether consciously, whether consciously or not, the news media have been assisting the FBI, has been assisting the FBI in their now overt in its, for its now overt attempts to set up my execution. This piece is um, the oldest work in the show. It was made in 2003, um, and it's a really important piece in my practice and in my evolution as an artist, and uh, Lena Essling um, brilliantly really kind of argued for it to be here in the show. Um, it's called the Symbionese Liberation Army, Screeds 13, 16, 20, and 29, and is based on the transcripts that um, a young heiress named Patricia Hurst and a radical left group, the Symbionese Liberation Army, who kidnapped her, <laughs> made during her kidnapping in 1974. Um, she was the, uh, the granddaughter of a newspaper magnet, and so this right wing, this left wing group kidnapped her in order to have access to the media. Um, what I was interested in when I made the work was where had some of these political demands gone, the political demands of the, of the radical left from the 70s. The ransom to get Patricia Hearst back was that the SLA asked the Hearst family to feed all the poor people in California. Um, and I became interested in uh, a kind of gap between the early 70s and the early 2000s when I made this. And a lot of the questions I was interested in asking were of the present moment. So I guess if we come back to Echo for a moment, here I used a strategy that I call re-speaking. Um, the original uh, objects that Patty Hearst and the SLA, SLA made were audio cassettes or audio tapes, reel-to-reel -reel audio tape. Um, and they record her talking to her parents, mom, dad. At first, there's four, four um, letters, if you will, audio letters from her to the public. They're addressed mom, dad. At first, they say, uh, I've had a few scrapes. I'm OK. They're taking care of me. But this is what they want. And so she's kind of communicating for the SLA. Um, by the end of the, by the last one, she begins death to the fascist insect that preys upon the people and declares that Patty Hearst is dead and she's taking this new name and she's staying with the group. Um, a lot of the question in this political case was whether she had been brainwashed and I was interested then in stepping into her words. I think it's really important that you take what they say very, very seriously. I think it's really, I think it's important that you take their, I think it's really important that you take their requests very seriously, and that you follow about not arresting any other SLA members, and that you follow and about, about following their good faith request to the letter. I took the four transcripts, I partially memorized them, not completely. I gave the copies to an audience and asked them to correct me when I'm wrong. So it becomes a kind of stutter, um, a, a, a broken, a fragmented way to receive this address. While some people have called this a reenactment, for me it operates very much outside of reenactment, which often tries to say, I can take this historical moment and I can put on a costume and I can dress it up and it can be as if it's here today or as if we're there, we're back there. For me, the, the relationship between a then and a now is much more complicated and more likely full of uh, stutters and mishearings and an, a, a kind of inability to um, have a, a whole picture or a whole um, understanding, but that those past moments don't, um, they don't only exist in their own, they do circulate through our, our present moment. And so by making this, what I think of as oral to oral translation between then and now, I'm able to ask some really important questions about 
the, the present political moment and um, what we've given up, asking why we don't ask for those things anymore, wh what, in what ways our, our language has changed, and um, allowing a little bit of consideration of uh, are we happy about that or sad about that or what, you know, where do we go from here? <laughs>